Good morning and good afternoon to all of our participants. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on sustainable energy entrepreneurship. Today we'll be hearing from five pioneering organizations working in the renewable energy sector who will share with us their experiences, challenges, and success factors. This webinar is being held by the International Renewable Energy Agency in partnership with the Ashton Awards for Sustainable Energy. IRENA is an intergovernmental agency mandated by countries around the world to promote the widespread and sustainable use of all forms of renewable energy. IRENA has 135 members and more than 35 states in the process of becoming members. Today's webinar will involve participants from IRENA's PROSPER initiative, as well as members from the Ashton Awards for Sustainable Energy. In the frame of its regional work, IRENA aims to support members of the economic community of West Africa uh, in their aspirations to tap the huge renewable energy potential in the region. IRENA has partnered with the ECOWAS Regional Centre for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency for the development and implementation of the PROSPER initiative. PROSPER stands for Promotion of Sustainable PV Market in the ECOWAS region. This initiative is geared to strengthen and develop local capacities of policymakers, utilities, branch managers of financial institutions, trainers from educational and research institutions, and renewable energy entrepreneurs in order to accelerate on-grid and off-grid renewable energy, and in particular solar photovoltaic system deployment. At the end of 2013, IRENA started engaging with entrepreneurs from ECOWAS with the objective to support and create a sustainable solar industry in West Africa through the transfer of best practices in solar energy entrepreneurship and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of innovative processes across different countries. IRENA organized training workshops bringing together various entrepreneurs and facilitating knowledge sharing with incubation centers in Burkina Faso and in India. Some of the entrepreneurs who attended the training program have managed to transform their businesses as a result, and some of those entrepreneurs are on our panel today. Ashton is a charity that promotes and supports pioneers in sustainable energy to accelerate the transition to a low-carbon society. Since 2001, winners of the Ashton Awards for Sustainable Energy have transformed the lives of more than 37 million people. Their inspiring stories show how, with ingenuity and determination, even the toughest challenges can be overcome. Winners of the Ashton Awards don't just receive prize money. They also are given a global platform to promote their work and access to a community of sustainable energy leaders. Working with expert partners, Ashton offers winners a package of support to help them expand. This is tailored to each winner and ranges from business and technical guidance to introductions in finance. They also help to build partnerships among winners so they can increase their impact and find ways to help winners share their expertise. Ashton will be accepting applications for their 2015 awards until next week on November 4th. And for those interested, you can find more information about the awards and the application process on ashton.org. Before we begin, we would like to share a quick note that IRENA does not endorse or recommend specific products or services shared within its webinar series. Information in this webinar is featured in the IRENA Renewable Energy Learning Partnership Database as just one of many best practice case studies. If you are interested in finding out more about future webinars hosted through the IRENA webinar series, please visit the IRENA Renewable Energy Learning Partnership website and sign up for our weekly newsletter to receive updates about courses, webinars, and internship opportunities in the sector. For today's webinar, we have two options for listening in. You may connect by computer by selecting mic and speakers, or by phone by selecting the telephone option in the right-hand panel. If you should face any technical difficulties during the webinar, please contact the GoToWebinar help desk at the number provided on your screen. I would like to encourage everyone to participate and ask questions by selecting the questions panel in the right hand bar and entering your questions with a note of who you would like the question directed to. We will be collecting questions throughout the webinar and we'll have a question and answer period following the presentations. If you would like to watch this webinar again or share it with a friend, 
We will have a full recording available on the IRELF website as well as on the IRENA YouTube channel. If we are not able to answer all of your questions during today's session and you wish to connect with our panelists, I encourage you to visit the IRENA community and join the Sustainable Energy Entrepreneurship discussion under Featured Topics. So to quickly review the agenda for today's session, I will begin by introducing our five panelists. Following this, I will hand the floor over to our panelists for their presentations. At the end of the session, we will have a question and answer, and then ask that you participate in a quick feedback survey to help us improve our webinar series. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists who, are very who we are very lucky to have with us today. Um, our first speaker, actually she will probably be joining us later on, uh, is Habiba Ali, who is the Managing Director and CEO of SOSI Renewable Energies in Nigeria. Uh, second, we will hear from Charlie Miller, who is the Head of Policy and Program Funding for SolarAid, where he manages the organization's relationships with governments, aid agencies, and foundations. We are also joined by Abdoulaye Ba, who is the CEO of COSIR Renewable Energy in Senegal. Next, we will hear from, from Abu Musuza, who is CEO and co-founder of Village Energy in Uganda. Abu's role is mainly strategic, defining the strategic direction of the company uh, and finding the necessary resources for the organization to achieve its strategic objectives. Lastly, we will hear from Emmanuel Kabore, who is the director of PPS Saro in Burkina Faso. I hope you all enjoy the webinar, and with that, I would like to hand the floor to our first speaker, who will be Abdullahi. Uh, Abdullahi, you now have the floor. No, no. Hello, hello, everybody. I am Abdullah, the CEO of Cosair in Senegal. I am based here in Senegal. After my degree in Germany, I come back to home to realize some pilot project about uh, in the field of uh, solar. So, with them, I have a contract with the Senegal government, and we have to uh, interview in the World Electrification Program. Go ahead. The so next slide, please. Thank you, Abdullah. So, and we are right now in Senegal since 2010, and we are have we have a part of solution for the World Education Program. But in the Senegal, since the implementation of energy reform. The rural education has uh, become a very big priority for government. And they established a lot of framework, a lot of measures have been implemented to increase electricity penetration. Given the urgent of the Republic, the government of Senegal has set a goal to achieve 50% education rate by 2017. Right now, the electricity coverage has sustainably improved in Senegal, but we increased it from 8% to 24% between 2002 and 2012. Next slide, please. So, so by the, the right, 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 two options. The options of concessions, it means a public-private partnerships, with a lot of uh, financing sources. And the government divided the country in 10 concessions. And each concession become a, a fundraiser, like the World Bank, African Development Bank, the European Bank. And each year they organize a meeting to dedicate those areas to a uh, concessionaire. By the second step, we have the local initiatives for education. It means a promotion of locality-initiated rural education projects 
in partnerships with communities, NGOs, private and local organizations. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So, no, no, please come back <laughs> again. So, yeah, so, so I am, I have a project by the second door, which means I have a three project in Senegal. So, next slide, please. So, and by this integration, we have three types of the market. We divided the market in three types of clients. We have some solution with zero batteries. It's in floating system from the grid. In Senegal, we have the feeding tariff law, but we didn't apply it till yet. That's why we are using some solution for offices, for uh, some big consumer. They can, during the day, use the solar without to feed it in the, in the, in the grid, just to use it. At the evening, they go back to the grid. Yeah. And we have a uh, second solution. It means by some villages, like right now, we install 50 kW peaks solar, no, 50 kW UPS hybrid generator. And we produce our electricity from the sun, and we have a gen tech as uh, backup. And the people will be connected to the local grid distribution, and each month they have to pay a bill. So, and the new one is by the third component, we go to the new solar hot water generations. Please go to the next slide. The next slide, please. So, and here, by the flutter or the electric, it means our clients, like, like they will use this inverter to produce during the day enough energy till 30% of the consumption during the day we use it from the solar. And at the evening they go back to the grid. So we have some pilot projects here in Senegal with a petrol station, a very big one, and some supermarkets are really yeah, open to have this effect of Go to the next slide, please. So by the next slide, it is a rural education related sites. We have right now 10 villages, 10 bigger, and we install those in Vesa, in those villages. We make a lot of panels on site, and uh, we introduce the genset generator, and we have a local distribution grid or network into the villages. And each one is connected to the grid, and they will pay at the end also months the electricity bills to me. I have a concession for 15 years with government, and we started right now. Please, the next slide, please. Next slide. So, how do you see it? No, no, no. Come back. It will take, come back to it. <laughs> well, yeah, we can see the achievement of not what we realize in the, in, in, in Matam region. Matam region is 720 kilometers north of Dakar. So, in those villages, we make a project and we involve we created or we realized the distribution networks, and this distribution network is powered by small solar mini grid systems and diesel generators. Please, the next slide. So here we have the region what we achieved in this region. If you go here, we install it in total 100. 20 approximately kilowatt peak solar and 120 gensets, KVA gensets. We realize a uh, distribution to grid 10 kilometer 40. We have 100 
uh, public land in, in the villages. And right now we have approximately 200 customers. But at this time when I make the flight, it was only 109. So it is a review of all even what we did in each region. And you can see in each village, by the first, Hombo is the name. We realized that we realized 20, 38 kilo what takes, 30 kVA agent sets, 2.8 kilometers of local distribution line, and we put 25 public lighting, and we connected to 28 customers. And the same, if you go down by calculation, you have the same 28 kilowatts peaks, solar, and 30 kVA gensets power, and we have 2.6 kilometers network, 25 lighting, public lighting, and 32 customers was connected at this time. So it is, the total you see down, we have 109 kilowatt peaks, 120 kVA gensets power, we have 10 kilometer point four local distribution to grid. We have 100 public lighting and 109 clients who were connected in 2012. So the next slide, please. The next slide, please. So it is some panorama of, of those here. It was at the beginning here in one solar field, you see. In the solar panels, we have 172 panels, and you see the, the, the technical local technique behind. So, let's go to the next slide. It is a genset what we have in each village. We put a genset as backup, only for backup. If the battery is not very full, we have to use it to, to recharge the battery. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. So here you can see we have some gold for the inverter. We put those instruments to, to regulate the, the output of the seconds of the of the grid. And you see on your right we have those batteries inside. It is a two volt, three hundred ampere hours. So it is an open set S batteries, three hundred ampere, two volts. Go to the next slide please. Here you see the range of all the batteries. The range of all the batteries. Go ahead. So this is the local, the technical local. And you can see inside we have another inverter from the Spain um, manufacturer too. We have a lot of, of them here. Okay, this is the two. And here we build the technical local with um, local uh, sources so that we can reduce the temperature of the battery inside the, the local, the technical room. Go ahead. So it is a new product, what we introduce right now in Senegal, too, because we see we have a lot of, um, lot of waste from, from the sun here in Senegal. If you have um, a water, a sort of hot water, you have to go several times to the roof and to put it. And we imagine right now with the German company to replace the solar hot water with solar panels in a special type of regulator. So it is uh, energy efficiency and cost, cost reduces a lot of, lot of cost. Please go to the next. So here it was my, uh, my traveling, I see some color <laughs> and I take the photo. 
and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Abdullahi, for that great presentation. So next we will be hearing from Charlie Miller from SolarAid. So Charlie, uh, you now have the floor. Thank you. Okay, um, so we are Sunny Money. We were fortunate enough to win the Ashton Gold Award last year. Um, Sunny Money is a dedicated last mile distributor of solar lights. Um, the largest distributor of solar lights in Africa with 1.3 million solar lights um, sold so far. Um, okay, right, a little bit about our model, some of the challenges and some of the solutions. Um, three years ago, when we were looking at the off-grid lighting market, we saw three kind of critical constraints. One was the affordability of lights, and the lights were too expensive. One was um, the levels of trust and demand in solar technology. Um, you know, even if people are investing ten dollars, often that's um, you know that's a big risk, and if it doesn't work out, people might not have enough food to eat. So. Um, overcoming customer risk aversion and getting people to believe that solar was a good investment was important. And then finally, availability of lights. Um, in many rural areas, it's difficult to obtain high quality lights. Um, we felt that manufacturers were struggling, manufacturers and distributors were struggling to extend value chains into rural areas because of the challenge of demand creation in rural areas. And we saw a need for a, a last mile distribution specialist and, and felt that was the role that we could play. Um, at the same time, there was this tremendous opportunity with the cost of the, the portable solar lights coming down all the time and the quality improving. Um, the lights we sell cost anything from 10 to about $150 delivering about 1 to, to 10 watts of power um, from your entry level study light on the right hand side there, the D-Light S2, right the way through to small home, solar home systems which can power multiple phones or can, can be used for TVs or fans. And 90% of our customers do live below the $1.25 a day poverty line and our focus as a social enterprise is to um, do things that normal um, companies maybe wouldn't do quite yet. Um, so we see ourselves very much operating on the fringes of the market and um, extending the development of that market, um, enabling it to reach um, more customer segments and poorer customer segments in more remote rural areas. How does the model work? The model works by bringing head teachers together and training them and incentivizing them to promote solar lighting to the parents of students. Um, by bringing head teachers together, we can cover an enormous geographical area without visiting every village. Um, head teachers are, of course, trusted members of their local communities, and we leverage the desire of parents to invest in the education of their children. So the head teachers will come to see us, they will um, receive some sample lights, they will receive marketing materials, um, and they will receive a small commission per sale. They go back to their communities, they promote solar lighting through demonstrations principally, and what that does is it unleashes a very powerful endorsement effect when people see and hear how much their friends and neighbors are saving on solar lighting, um, they want one too. And it's at that point where it becomes possible to set up agent networks for the first time. Once you've created that demand through the Ministry of Education and through the head teacher networks, you can recruit agents that make lights permanently available at affordable prices in those rural areas. And that's, um, you know, that's the point at which we find other um, companies coming in and helping to service the demand that we've created. So this model has been um, very, very successful. I think Ashton recognized, um, we're kind enough to recognize uh, our school campaign approach to demand creation as, um, as a clear example of innovation in, in energy access for, for bottom of pyramid consumers. Um, the model has enabled our growth to, to really continue to, to, to accelerate over time, over the last, um, what, three years or so. Um, and as, as I say, that graph is a bit out of date now because we've now sold 1.3 million lights. The latest um, data we have for market penetration puts us at between 20 and 25% of all the lights um, sold in Africa by volume. 
Um, this, of course, needs to be understood within the context of even faster market growth. Um, you know, we've seen off-grid lighting markets going from 90 to 95 percent between 2009 to 2012, um, accelerating up to over 110 percent in 2014. That's the latest data from Lighting Africa. And of course, it's not just about lighting. You know, lighting is the first step. Phone charging is the second. The third is um, TV and um, fan, fan use and ultimately we see we see this kind of technology playing um, a big role in, in driving access to the internet and access to modern financial services. One of the most interesting things about our model is the way it creates trust not just for solar products but also for solar services. So here we have a quote from um, the leading solar as a service company in Tanzania um, where people pay on an ongoing basis over time in a model that couldn't be more different to our, to our focus on products. Um, but even they, because of the trust that has been established in solar technology, even they are finding it much easier to sell their utility style model um, in areas where we have um, seeded the market with, with entry level lights. What have been the challenges? Um, one ongoing challenge has been the challenge of building trust and demand. We see that as less of an issue now in markets like Kenya and Tanzania where growth really is going very, very quickly. But um, still a challenge in countries such as Malawi or, or Zambia where market penetration is much lower and there is still a need to, to get a few lights out there, good quality lights out there to create the demand and make it easier for businesses to extend their value chains into rural areas. Another challenge we face is um, management information. We, we, we are a stage removed from our customer because of the way we work through head teachers and agents. Um, and now, you know, having been able to progress on those issues to some extent, I would say one of the challenges we face is building a, building a brand. Obviously, it's easy for D-Light or Greenlight Planet to, to have their brand out there because they simply brand their lights. Um, we brand our sales agents, but um, we're keen to do as much as possible to, to build our brand because um, you know, we want to position ourselves as a product neutral retailer which is able to offer impartial advice as well as a range of quality products, but it's tough. Um, we're facing increased competition in countries such as Kenya, which, uh, which is very welcome um, and inevitable as the market grows, but um, yeah, it's, it's not easy, you know, trading conditions do get difficult once the market begins to grow very, very quickly as, as the different manufacturers and larger importers such as ourselves compete for limited um, distribution capacity, limited numbers of agents and entrepreneurs and shops able to um, sell significant volumes. And then finally, um, we faced a challenge with delivering after sales care. Um, it's really important for us that people have a positive experience with solar. That means if that their light fails, then they need to be able to get their warranty honored. And ultimately, you know, we want, we want off-grid lighting to emerge as a truly sustainable industry. And that means that we need to encourage repair and recycling, um, both of which are difficult partly because of the low volumes of lights being sold overall and partly because um, some of the lights are designed not to be tampered with and um, you know hopefully that's something that will change over time so that um, we can we can make off-grid lighting a waste-free industry. Um, continuing challenges which we've always faced have been around working capital and access to finance. Um, all of our money is tied up in stock coming across the sea from China and correspondingly with our agents, um, many of them are, are limited in the business they can do because of access to finance. Uh, so that's a key issue for us is create, finding creative solutions to relieve those financial bottlenecks at all stages of the value chain. Um, and then still some of the same issues that we've been facing for the whole time that we've been in business has been um, kerosene not being seen as a problem, affordability still being a barrier even at $10. One of the things we're doing to address that is we're developing the cheapest pay-as-you-go solar light that has ever been developed at the moment, trialing that and aiming to roll that out. We believe that that could have a huge impact on, on market growth. And then availability is still a challenge. You know, with market penetration at 11% in Kenya, which is the biggest market in Africa, I, should, I believe, um, you know, lights are still largely unavailable in many parts of the country, so agent networks continue to need to continue to be built out 
um, and retained because you know it's very easy for for manufacturers to come in and um, to establish direct business relationships with our agents, and that's a risk for our business. But it's part of competition that we accept, and you know it's actually good for the market as a whole and the end consumer. So um, I guess the only other thing I would add is that, that um, you know the focus on grid and grid-like technologies, we really see that as as oversupply for many of the people um, who who really only have um, you know, demand for energy services is, is largely limited to lighting and mobile phone use, and hopefully eventually, you know, television and internet access, but um, we would really advocate a demand-led approach to energy access, and um, that's why we focus on the smaller scale technologies, because we believe these have the greatest potential to go to scale, and that focusing on this scale of technology will deliver the maximum social impact per person uh, enabled to access a modern a monitor, modern energy product. So the success factors, um, leveraging the desire of parents to invest in education and you know to 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 you, taking advantage of those relationships of trust when you're trying to create demand has been really critical for us. Working in partnership, not trying to do everything on our own. Um, most obviously with the head teachers. Who are um, you know who have an infrastructure and who have links in those communities that are far stronger than any travelling salesman would have. Taking risks and being prepared to innovate. We stumbled across our, our distribution model after a long period of trial and error and, and trying to sell out in in many many different ways. And it really was that um, being prepared to take risks and being prepared to try new things and admit when things weren't working that enabled us to find um, a distribution model which, um, which really had the potential to take our business to scale. And, you know, in a, in a similar vein, I think, um, you know, it's important to embrace failure as the path to success. You know, we have had um, many, many ideas that sounded good but didn't work along the way. Um, but if we hadn't tried those ideas, then we never would have learnt what we've learnt. So, you know, that's been really, really important to us. And as a, as a business wholly owned by a charity, we are able to, to share information about our model in ways that wouldn't make sense for a more purely commercially motivated entity. And we are at the moment looking for ways to, to share what we've learnt and to support other um, African SMEs that are trying to enter the off-grid lighting market um, and trying to figure out creative ways to do that, anything from open sourcing to, to um, developing partnerships that involve our staff training or advising other companies and NGOs on how they might, um, how they might um, enter the off-grid lighting market. So all this is still to come, but um, yeah, we're very proud of what we've achieved so far. But it's really only the tip of the iceberg, and there is a long way to go, championing a bottom-up approach to energy access and giving African consumers the immediate improvements in energy that they demand now, however incremental, rather than making them wait for levels of energy supply that they do not need and that there is no demand for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie, for that great presentation. And next we will be hearing from Abu. So, Abu, you now have the floor. Here we go. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Abu is my name. I'm just going to run through uh, very briefly the story of um, Village Energy Hours is a bit of a unique story because it involves a pivot that we uh, just recently went through. Um, I usually like to start with this slide. Um, it's a picture of, um, I believe it's Bangalore in India, um, but it's basically uh, asking that question of uh, if you can imagine the city where you come from, uh, but there was no car mechanic, um, you know, how many of you would uh, be willing to purchase a car? Um, because when your neighbor's car breaks down, they cannot, you know, they don't have um, a nearby place uh, to repair their car, or they have to basically uh, send their car, you know, over 200 kilometers away to get uh, to get a repair done. Um, and that 
is uh, pretty much uh, the, the issue with um, mainly the installed solar systems, uh, um, I'd say in Uganda. So about 60% of them um, are broken. Uh, the ones that if you take a five-year period and you sample that, are very informal research. It's very difficult to get numbers, uh, accurate numbers of this uh, in research. But our very brief research so it shows that um, about 6% of the solar systems installed are broken. Um, and you know the one never fixed. Um, now I might say that it doesn't. This doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the products that were installed um, are bad. Uh, in fact, uh, in our simple research, we also discovered that 75% of these cases were because um, end users did not know how to handle the product. Um, and uh, for Village Energy, we were part of um, of this challenge for a long time. Um, we have worked across the value chain. We initially started as um, a company that assembles, uh, assembles. We attempted to assemble a homemade solar system. By homemade, I mean made in Uganda, part sourced uh, uh, from cottage industries, you know, and local suppliers, and we put together what you see in, um, in that screenshot. Um, it's home solar systems. Uh, the quality of light, the system performed very well, and in fact, it performed better than. Um, a fair number of products that are imported uh, from uh, from Asia mainly. Um, the problem is that the, the products were breaking quite often. Um, even the larger systems, um, we partnered with microfinance institutions um, and were providing loans for these products and other products that we had made. Uh, but we consistently got calls from end users. Um, the end users were calling the microfinances and complaining about the, the products, you know, breaking and you know, not working as promised. Um, and so we invested a lot of money trying to run back um, into deep rural areas um, to try and figure out, you know, what exactly is wrong. Um, and in 75% of those cases, it's that the customer did not follow the instructions um, as we, you know, as, as we had trained them at the point of practice. And that is where our key insight came um, as a company, uh, that more often than not, especially for the home solar systems that require, you know, uh, a bit of interaction with, uh, with, the end, with the end user, is that the buyer at the end of the day is not the actual user of the solar system. What I mean is that uh, when the head of the household uh, purchases a solar system, goes out to purchase a solar system from home, um, in the solar industry we educate at the point of purchase. Uh, and then the, the head of the household who's purchasing the solar system, who's also, um, in most cases, uh, the breadwinner of the household, takes it home, uh, it gets it installed. That person spends even up to 16 hours away from home. Um, and so for those 16 hours, um, it's everyone else who is not educated on how to use the solar system, uh, the one interacting with the solar system. Uh, and so that's where all uh, the challenges began, all the issues began. Um, whether it's uh, the you know the mother, the children, you know the relative who is at home, um, who you know uses the solar system beyond the hours, or you know presses something, or, or does something, or plants something uh, that wasn't initially meant to be used, um, it's very difficult for them to uh, to own up to the fact that they broke the solar system and owning up to the uh, you know to the purchaser of the solar system, who is in this case the head of the household, the father, the mother. Um, and head of household usually calls, you know, when they are extremely vivid about the fact that the solar system is not working the way it's supposed to. Um, and so that's that's you know that's where we felt um, you know was was one of the big issues. But also um, the fact that uh, you know there is no real um, after sell service program, uh, as Charlie had mentioned. Uh, there's no after after sell service program, you know, that that was really existent. Um, and we looked around to try and find out, you know, is there anyone who's providing an after sales service? But how, how are people taking care of the product? Um, and in many cases, we found that people had, you know, just abandoned their solar products uh, months ago, or some of them years ago, uh, resigned the fact that solar systems don't work. Um, and that makes uh, market penetration a bit difficult as well, uh, because selling a new product uh, in such a market is very difficult. And uh, in many cases, we found that most of people whose solar systems had broken were returning back to using kerosene uh, because it's, they can't go without lights. 
so you know they just pull out and dust off uh, the kerosene lens and that they were using and then they go back to using kerosene. Uh, so in the sector, uh, we're not uh, exactly uh, addressing the challenge of kerosene as we should uh, because a lot of people also assist in break go back to using kerosene. If there was a good after sales service program, then the period uh, Within which they use the solar system would at the very uh, would basically period they go back to using it in lantern or uh, or a candle would reduce drastically. Uh, but for now, uh, the average period is between eight to twelve weeks, so they have to go back to using kerosene. Um, and so this is basically something that we uh, we not at least in Uganda we've not been to, uh, able to deliver uh, the consistent access of quality basic electricity, which is one of the things that. Uh, people in off-grid um, locations really, really want. Um, and so uh, people were basically focused on, uh, we asked ourselves the question, what if we, uh, instead of chasing uh, people who did, not, who did not have solar systems to try and sell a new one, what if we chased those who had solar systems that were broken? Uh, what can, you know, uh, can we make, you know, a real market out of that? Can we have a positive impact on the entire sector, on, on the market? Um, as a way of basically increasing the penetration of um, solar systems. So we, we are currently, as much as we're trying to focus on service repair and maintenance um, of solar systems, currently in Uganda we're the only company that um, is dedicated to that, um, to providing an after sales service program. Um, and so we basically went uh, deep into the rural areas. Um, and our approach is basically fast to talk to community leaders. Um, and basically introduce our program to them and say, hey, what we're here to do is not to sell a new solar system, but we want to find households that have solar systems that broke down um, and basically provide a service to them, uh, repair it, provide a spare part uh, to them um, so that you know, they, they, they can gain the real value uh, of their investment. Um, but also very importantly, our model involves working with, um, working with uh, what we call village technicians. Um, and these are basically, uh, what we do is we are targeting um, radio and phone repairmen who are based in villages. Um, the reason why we are targeting uh, uh, radio and phone repairmen is because they are easier to train. Uh, so they know a fair amount of electricity, they can work with circuitry, um, and so training them how to repair um, a solar system uh, is fairly easy in terms of, in terms of time, uh, but also in terms of the cost that you have to, in, to, to, you know, to get in. Uh, to, to basically do the training. So what their role is to basically go into the villages where they are based, find uh, households that have solar systems that are broken, um, and provide an after sales service. So for households, we basically do not provide a direct service to them. Um, and so our, 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 our market, our direct market is, is, is uh, village technicians. Um, and then they basically, in, through them, we directly reach out to households. So we train them, um, build a, a supply chain for spare parts that reach them effectively, um, and basically provide them the branding, provide them market support to be able to reach out uh, to households that have uh, that have um, that have uh, so systems that are broken. Uh, so like I say, we do retraining and provide them with spare parts uh, so that they can perform the role effectively. Um, and this is basically our ambition, to be able to deliver an after sales service within 48 hours of when an end user uh, complains uh, of a breakdown in the solar system. Um, I must also point out that we are not only working uh, with on households in rural areas, but we also have larger institutions um, whose needs are a bit different, uh, whose need is basically to, uh, to have a solar system work consistently. So for those we get into after sales service contracts, um, and we provide preventive maintenance, uh, schedule four visits a year to make sure that their solar systems um, are not uh, are working the way they are, they are meant to work. Um, so what, what achievements have we had? Uh, we've basically been able to work, it's pretty much, much more on a low-key pilot phase. Uh, we've been able to work with nine village technicians uh, in nine different villages. Um, one of the challenges here that I did not, I did not write in, in the list of challenges that I will come to is that we've discovered that a village is a fairly small uh, market for a, for a technician uh, because on average a village has about 100 households and if 
uh, about 60 percent of two assistants in that village of Brockington. We have about only 60 households to work with. So we are restructuring this and trying to basically provide a much bigger market to work on a sub county level, which probably has about 400 to 500 households. That should give them a good market uh, throughout the year. Um, so we, through them, we've basically been able to restore about 200 solar systems worth about um, have, uh, have about thirty thousand uh, dollars in solar assets. Uh, is what I mean. So we basically try and compute uh, the cost of the solar system initially when the end user bought it, um, and we basically take that you know as a value of the solar system that we have restored. Um, we've been able to create, obviously, uh, jobs um, and income, new income sources for young people that we work with, or little technicians that we train. Uh, we target uh, 30 years and below. Uh, that's, our, that, that's our target. Um, and here are just a few challenges that we've, uh, that we've faced throughout. This may be even before uh, we pivoted. Um, like uh, Charlie said, uh, low market confidence in solar products. Um, this is partly, in our opinion, due to many solar systems that have broken down and were never um, fixed by the initial suppliers. Um, so, like I said, it's very difficult to sell a new uh, a new product. Uh, so we face that largely because of largely when we are still distributing solar products. Um, and friendly government policy. Um, one of the one of the big issues, at least in Uganda, is that people are buying solar systems like they're buying um, a kilo of sugar from a retail store. Uh, so anyone can sell any solar system and so people end up buying uh, solar parts that won't work for them, either hugely oversized products or grossly undersized products. This is, this is mainly for household products um, that need to be installed, that need to be designed, that, need, you know, that are designed to meet specific demands. Um, and so um, the government policy, you know, the, and listen, the policy only focuses on testing solar parts that are coming into the country. It doesn't focus on how are people acquiring these solar products. Um, so that, that has been huge and has contributed a lot to people buying solar systems that are not playing the part as they wanted and which basically results into a low market uh, confidence. This consumer ignorance, um, and this is, this is largely uh, around solar. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, consumers don't know how to handle products. We are educating, uh, in my opinion, the wrong end user. Uh, we are only educating the person who purchases, but not actually the person who uh, uses the solar system. And so, one of the one of the big programs that we are um, uh, we are uh, implementing is customer education. Every time we fix a solar system at a, uh, at a household or uh, at an office or at an institution. Uh, we dedicate time to sit down with the users of the solar systems and basically educate them on why there was a problem, what they can do to prevent that problem, um, etc. Uh, of course, cash flow uh, is a big issue. Uh, we are currently are largely working with uh, small quantities of spare parts as we are basically moving uh, and growing um, the market. Um, those are very expensive. We get them locally on the market. They're very expensive. Uh, um, and in many cases, uh, end users, you know, uh, want you to provide the service first before they make the payment, uh, which puts you into a lot of uh, cash flow issues. Supply chain is still a big thing as well. Uh, we're trying to work hard to build a supply chain that comes directly from manufacturers um, in Asia, um, mainly in Asia, uh, all the way down to the end user um, in, in a deep off-grid place or an institution in an off-grid location. Uh, so that's, that's still a bit of a challenge, which has kept the cost of our, of our spare parts relatively high. Uh, um, I should say also here, another challenge is transportation. Uh, the African terrain, especially in the rural terrain, is very difficult to navigate. Transport networks, um, addresses, all of that, you know, doesn't exist. Uh, but you know, through our technician approach, we are able to reach um, places that uh, that were not able to reach before, and much much price both in terms of
um, is also a difficult thing. Uh, either how to find uh, people who are qualified or those that are Um, so finally, uh, this is basically our three to five years. We want to basically be able to send missions across Rwanda. Uh, they will basically be, um, we estimate that that will be our best. Um, and uh, Abu, you seem to be cutting out, so I'm going to return the screen to, to us here. Okay, and actually I see that you've just finished your presentation. So now we will hand the, the floor over to Emmanuel for him. Okay, morning uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Emmanuel uh, from PPS in Burkina Faso, PPS in Solar Project uh, Power. Uh, PPS is created in uh, uh, 2010. Uh, with uh, an, electric, uh, an electrician, uh, engineer, and uh, technician in Burkina from Burkina Faso. So, solar for a uh, photovoltaic department of uh, PPS, uh, we we do a, it's essentially in uh, isolated system because we work for uh, rural people and. Uh, uh, in Burkina, uh, we have only 20% of population uh, got energy, so we have uh, too much job with uh, rural people to give them uh, energy, and uh, the best system now it is a solar photovoltaic uh, system. So we put solar photovoltaic system for, for schools, a sanitary system, F systems and uh, water pumping systems. So we work uh, also for uh, public roads. We use solar system for public uh, for lighting uh, in public roads. So we use uh, a LED for the public uh, road uh, lighting, but. Uh, after we only buy LED uh, solar panels and uh, regulator in, uh, in, in Europe and after that all the, the support is made in Burkina with uh, our wielders. And now we have uh, in Burkina, uh, we work uh, with uh, a, a rural bank whose name is uh, Caisse Populaire. And with this rural bank, we give credit to the rural people and the rural bank give them uh, the credit and we do the installation and after they can uh, buy uh, after two years maximum and uh, now we since our creation we we installate uh, uh, 775 uh, kilowatt of uh, solar panels for electrical and uh, pumping system in Burkina Faso and West Africa as uh, Beni and uh, Niger. So essentially we use uh, only, only uh, isolation system because uh, uh, the line of uh, power is very cheap and expensive, uh, very, very, very expensive in our country because uh, uh, only the big town got energy. So when they must build a line to the big town to a, a village, it's very, very uh, cheap for the population. So it's they cannot buy it. So government or uh, direct private population uh, call us to 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 do dimension for for if they want to to electrify schools or F system F house and uh, with the, the rural bank 
a test pupillaire. The, we have a project and they have a contract now because the, the, the rural people have it difficult to buy uh, suddenly and uh, immediately the, 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 the price of the solar installation. So the rural bank give them the money, PPS do the installation, and uh, after the rural bank uh, take uh, the, the money with the population uh, after two years ago. So we do a solar pumping system for irrigation in Burkina because Burkina is uh, a agricultural country. So people need water to, to drink, but they need water also to, to agriculture. Because uh, to have uh, water in Burkina, you are obliged to drink uh, to drill uh, between uh, six, 60 or 50 meter. But so pumping the water to by hand uh, in uh, this uh, distance is very uh, difficult for women. So we we use uh, water solar pump and uh, for the population. And after they, 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 they do a groupment, a, an association, and the, the bank, the rural bank, give them the money, and uh, they sell water, and after they buy the, the, the solar system. Uh, we, I say that we use a, a solar system for public road. In the big town, uh, we have too much, uh, the, the energy is not uh, very good, so, uh, to 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 light the road or for uh, the the station of uh, pumping or as total or shell uh, petrol pumping, they call us to to give them uh, solar energy to for backup. So uh, we we ask every time uh, job uh, for in uh, in this case. So now in, in PPS we are 25 uh, 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 technicians and engineers now, but uh, we, uh, with the new project we have uh, with um, the rural bank we are uh, we create uh, 100 direct employees, and uh, after we have uh, between uh, 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 near this uh, the, the, this 100 technician we have uh, one two or uh, three hundred seller in uh, the in whole of uh, Burkina Faso because we must uh, we must uh, install it uh, 100 uh, uh, let me see. One, 100 uh, uh, solar system uh, no no 100 uh, 100,000 I'm sorry 100,000 solar system uh, in, uh, in Burkina Faso with this bank. So, uh, as I explained to you, uh, I'm not, we are only uh, specialized in solar system for isolated system because uh, uh, the policy of uh, the National uh, Agency of Energy in Burkina forbid us to, to connect solar energy in uh, the, the, the power line. So, we are forbidden. To, now, we cannot uh, do a, a, a another installation uh, than a isolation system. So uh, I, you ask me to to have <laughs> 100 uh, uh, more. So I uh, I don't uh, uh, prepare too much things to to show. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for your presentation. And um, so now we will open the floor for uh, questions. And so the first question will go to to Abu. Um, Abu, someone is uh, wondering um, how how does that people usually pay for your systems? Um, so uh, maybe you can answer that. The, the floor is yours now. So, so basically, people pay for spare parts. So, the, the the way the model works is that we work through 
um, there are two types of, of systems. First, the institutions, that's, that's a direct payment to Village Energy, and we sign a service uh, and maintenance contract. Uh, so they pay us uh, upfront uh, for a year's contract, or some of them two to three years, um, and basically provide them, you know, a preventive, preventive maintenance service. Uh, for the households um, in off-grid places, they basically, what, what happens is that we train uh, the village technicians to sort of run their own micro enterprises to expand uh, their businesses to involve um, solar after sales services. So the end user pays the village technician for uh, the labor, the time they spend, you know, at the household. Um, but when it comes to part. Uh, we basically distribute the spare parts to uh, the village technician and then the village technician can sell them onwards for a small margin. We sell them onwards to, uh, to the households and the end users. Um, and so the, the village technicians basically buy from us the spare parts. Um, and and the end users buy the spare parts from the village technicians. Not all repair broken, uh, simple things. Those ones basically the village technicians just earn the money directly. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Abu. Um, the next question was for uh, Abdullahi. Um, Abdullahi, um, we have a um, participant wondering if you uh, how you deal with issues of maintenance. And if you've ever had issues with theft of systems, Abdullah, you have the floor. With the maintenance, could you hear me? Hello, everybody. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Abdullah. Could you? Okay. So in each village where we go, we have to recruit two people, the technical guys, in each village. And they become support from us. And they, are, they have to, um, to put the panels, to check the battery levels. And they, in my office in Dhaka, I can see through internet the production line. So that it's mainly we have in each village two technicians. And yeah, we support them to make the maintenance. And Abdullah, it, have you ever had any issues with theft? Hello? Hello, yes, Abdullah, have you ever had any issues with theft? Stealing um, systems? No. Yeah, we have right now one, one inventory is broken out, it's burning, total burning. And we will make replacement for that. Okay. Usually we don't have any trouble with that. Okay. People they are just making report to me, and we call them each day. We don't have problems with that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next question is for Charlie from Solar Aid. We have one participant wondering how you deal with conflicting interests, like shopkeepers losing sales on kerosene due to the increased penetration of solar light. So, Charlie, you have the floor now. That's an absolutely fascinating um, issue and question, and it's not something that I feel that we've um, fully addressed. Uh, we have been looking at doing a little piece of work with the Aga Khan Foundation in Tanzania to specifically explore um, what happens to kerosene servers in areas where solar lights um, become more commonplace. Um, obviously, you know, we have our agent proposition and we try to displace the income lost on kerosene with income from solar lights, but uh, the truth is that we don't, we don't know enough 
about what it does to kerosene sellers' incomes and what alternatives are available to them. Of course, whenever you're building a market and doing economic activity and, and you know, the environment is shifting, there will be winners and losers. And um, for us, it is really important to mitigate the negative impact of the emergence of this technology. Um, I have to hold my hands up and say that um, we don't know enough about the issue, and it may be that there is more we can do, but I would emphasize that it's something that we're committed to, to finding out more about and understanding better, um, so that we can ensure that um, you, know, you, min you minimize the, the downside of um, the emergence of this exciting market. Thank you so much, Charlie, for that. Uh, our next question is for Abdullah uh, again, or sorry, it's for uh, Abu. Um, Abu, we have a participant wondering how many people do you employ uh, in your company? How many people I employ? Yeah. Um, so actually, initially when we, uh, before we did the pivot, we had about 15 people uh, in the team, but that has, that, that has since gone down to about seven people now. Um, and those are basically largely, the, the, the biggest chunk of that is more in, in training of the village technicians. Uh, so these are basically like our own technicians who are doing installations before, and have, their role has been uh, revised into training um, village technicians. It's more like a customer management role, our customers being the village technicians that we train. So they, they, they're in charge of training, they're in charge of uh, you know, managing uh, the supply chain for spare parts to this particular uh, village technician. So each, each of our technicians has specific, you know, we're scheduling, doing it in a way that each of our village technicians has a specific geography that they are responsible for. So that comes with training, with Know, managing the supply chain for spare parts to that, to that area, um, you know, looking into you know the marketing, getting on radio, you know, and, and all other activities, the branding, making sure that you know uh, all the compliance is uh, is made. So currently, we are about seven people. Of those, uh, four of those are, are, are technicians, and the three, are, it's, since we are still you know relatively small, the three are focusing on uh, on the administration of the office. Thank you, Apu. Uh, our next question is for Emmanuel. Emmanuel, uh, we have a participant who is wondering how you reach your customers. Um, what is your marketing strategy for PPS? Emmanuel, you have the floor. Okay. The number of customers uh, uh, for us, uh, uh, since our creation, is uh, between uh, uh, 700 and uh, 1,000. I think that the, the participant is wondering um, what sort of strategies you have for marketing your services and systems to people. Um, how do you advertise and sell these systems to people in Burkina Faso? Uh, but we do this installation and after we, we do the, the after cell service, but uh, the, for the after cell service, we train the, the, the end user to clean the, the panel and uh, clean uh, connecting of battery. But uh, when the, the, they got uh, a problem uh, and uh, they cannot uh, resolve it, we have a, 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 a number, an utterance number, so we can call uh, every time a, a one technician from PPS. Thank you. And and how do people know about your company? How do they hear about PPS and find out what you are doing? Uh, how to to know how to we want to know why why uh, our, our people uh, do our uh, our company. We are publicity. We do uh, we do communication in uh, TV and radio and uh, internet. Great, thank you very much. Our next question is for Charlie. Um, Charlie, we have a participant wondering how you compete with isolated solar grid systems that work on a customer pair basis, um, if there's any competition at all. Yeah, I think um, with the 
is that a mini grid technology just to be clear um, they didn't specify they just said isolated solar grid systems yeah I believe that's mini grids so um, just wanted to double check um, I don't think we see a tremendous amount of competition with mini grids because um, the off-grid lighting market um, is basically focused on more remote areas than are reached by most mini grids. Um, you know, our market penetration for off-grid lighting for the distributed sector has gone from one to about four and a half percent in the last five years. And um, the market growth rate has accelerated from 90 to 95 percent year on year to over 110 percent in the last 12 months. Those are Lighting Africa statistics. Um, the mini grid sector is demonstrating uh, no, nothing close in terms of um, the speed of its growth or the number of people that it reaches. The places where mini grids are most likely to thrive are more densely populated um, areas, peri-urban areas, um, towns and some villages, um, but largely um, yeah, bigger places, more densely populated places. So, you know, we see kind of different customer segments for, for distributed energy and for mini grids. Um, and it's not just to do with how densely populated the area is, it's also to do with the amount of demand that there is for energy, which is predominantly determined by how much people can afford to spend on energy. Um, and, you know, the growth of the mini-grid sector will be a huge development, but the fact is that there's a significant proportion of the population which um, cannot afford and does not have demand for enough energy to warrant a mini-grid. So, you know, I think, I think we've seen that natural segments, natural customer segments for both of those technologies, um, and there is not significant overlap between them. But um, you know, where there is overlap, I think um, you know, potentially the development of, of pay-as-you-go solar home systems and the trust in technology which is established for entry-level lighting um, you know, could in some ways pave the way for, for people to be more willing and more active and effective customers for mini-grids. Um, you know, it's, again, it's another area that we want to look at more in future is to understand the relationship between those technologies. But right now, there aren't a huge um, number of contact points between our work and technology of that scale. Great. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, while you're speaking, I'll, I'll just address one more to you. We have um, another participant wondering, uh, working in such, uh, over such a large territory, how do you deal with um, different government laws? Um, from country to country in your operations? Oh, it's difficult, to say the least. Um, we're active in the Kenyan and Tanzanian Renewable Energy Associations. Um, as part of SolarAid's broader collaborative market development work, we're very keen to support efforts to improve the policy environment in a country such as Malawi, where the VAT and the tariffs are, are still high and effectively preventing the growth of the off-grid lighting market there. And um, yeah, government relations are not are not easy to manage, but um, of course essential. You know, we believe that the growth of the off-grid lighting market offers tremendous development impact, um, tremendous contribution to to the plans and strategies that governments are pursuing across Africa, and that this is a win-win situation where if they can put in place policies that support this market, the windfall in terms of savings on kerosene subsidies, in terms of increased investment in, in the rural economy, in terms of increased hours of child study, in terms of improved nutrition, safety, you know, reduced incidence of burns and fires and indoor air pollution. Um, the, the payoff for, for governments is tremendous. Um, even including the tax base, I think I would say, because kerosene is so often subsidized and displacing kerosene um, can directly save money on kerosene subsidy bills. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we have to work in partnership with government and we need to reach out to them and to ask them to, to pay more attention to the potential of distributed energy solutions and not to treat energy policy as, as grid policy. Um, there is so much more to it than that, and the governments that realize that will be um, at a tremendous advantage and really will be the leaders in efforts to achieve sustainable energy for all over the next 11 years, or 15 years. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, our next question is uh, to Abdullah. We have um, someone wondering how um, your customers pay once they become connected to the mini-grid. They're wondering if it's metered or if it's a flat rate. Uh, 
Up the line. Okay, I think we'll continue on to the next question. Um, we have someone uh, wondering, uh, sorry, this question is directed to Abu. Um, if weather conditions ever affect your operations, such as rainstorms, how do you get? I'm sorry, you, you just went out briefly? Uh, yes, we have a, a participant wondering if weather conditions ever affect your operations and how you deal with these issues, like rainstorms and... Um, uh, well, the, the, only, the most direct way it affects uh, our work is basically, I mean, in some instances, uh, some places, you know, get relatively impossible. Uh, so it, we still have to rely quite a bit on um, in some sort of transportation to get um, the spare parts out to the rural areas. So even if we are building hubs uh, from Kampala, we build a hub, you know, nearby in, 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 in a town from where spare parts can go out. So sometimes uh, so we, we always have to transport uh, spare parts between, you know, from, from the hub in, deep into the rural areas to where the village technicians are. Uh, but, you know, sometimes the roads are impossible. That's not, you know, it's not really, really a big thing. Um, but mostly it's, you know, getting, you know, uh, calls from customers um, who, who are basically asking, you know, why is my source system down, you know, and you have to explain to them that it's probably because, um, you know, the weather is not good, it hasn't charged up really well, so you might experience, you know, a few, you know, lesser hours, you know, than, than you usually do, but in terms of uh, a big impact on our after sales service business, not really. Great, thank you so much, Abu. And I'm very sorry to have to cut the question and answer period short, but we are running out of time. Um, we've received lots of questions, which is great, and we'd like to continue this discussion. Um, so I will be circulating all of the presentations along with the recording, um, and also a link to the IRENA community will, where we will be engaging all of our panelists, and that will be a great place where you can continue to ask questions and connect with these panelists um, directly. Um, so uh, please do not worry if your question was not answered today. We will get back to you, certainly. So uh, lastly, um, before you leave, we would like to ask that you help us um, in providing a little bit of uh, feedback to help us improve our webinar series. Uh, so we have just a quick poll with three questions. You just have to answer the question as it appears on your screen. So the first question is, the webinar provided useful information and insight. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, overall, the webinar met my expectations. Great, thank you. And the last question is, the webinar presenters were effective. Okay, thank you very much for your feedback. And lastly, before we close the webinar session, I would like to invite you all to connect with IRENA on social media. Uh, so you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, on the IRENA community, and on LinkedIn. And we look forward to continuing this discussion with you on the IRENA community. Uh, thank you once again to all of our participants and wish you all a very good day. <laughs>